Welcome everybody. My name is Marty Mascari. I am with the North Central Texas Area Agency on Aging and the North Central Texas Aging and Disability Resource Center. I'm actually a contractor with them for some various programs, but those are both under the North Central Texas Council of Governments in the greater Dallas Fort Worth, Texas area. We are blessed to have our partners with the James Al West Center for Dementia Care. Uh, once again, um, to talk to us about caring for someone in early stages of dementia. Before we get started, I'm going to let Jamie go through mm -hmm. the CEUs, if you would. Yes, thank you, Marty. We are happy to provide CE credits for sorcerer work, nursing, licensed professional counselors, and a certificate of attendance for one and a half hours for today's program. Um, Marty will be sending a follow-up email and in that email, there will be a link to a survey monkey evaluation. We ask that everybody completes the evaluation so we can um, hone our programs and meet the needs of our audience. But if you want the CE credits, you must complete the evaluation. And if you will allow us about three to four weeks to get the certificates um, processed and sent back out to you by email. Um, also, the link to the survey monkey evaluation will close at the end of the day on um, April the 19th. Thank Very you. good. Um, in addition to um, to Jamie's uh, survey monkey evaluation, there's also a Google evaluation that's done that we that we have set up uh, so that we can get your feedback and report back on the goals and objectives we set out when we applied for the funding um, uh, to do these. Um, the Google survey should pop up, or you should get an opportunity to do that as you log out of Zoom today. But if you don't, some people have popped pop-up blockers, no worry. Um, it will also be in the follow-up email. But please um, make sure you, you deviate between the survey monkey, which is required for CEUs or um, certificates of attendance, and the Google survey that we're just asking you to complete as well. I'm going to let Jamie, not that I introduce you, but will you introduce Holly and we'll get going? Happy to. So Holly is your presenter today, and Holly is a licensed professional counselor herself and dementia expert. Um, she has been with the West Center for five years, going on six, and we're happy to have her. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Jamie and Marty. Glad to be here and glad to be back full time. So back to work. And we are actually starting the, uh, this is the first of a three-part series. So today we are going to do caring for someone in the early stages of dementia. Next month we'll do the middle stages and the following month we'll do the late stages of the disease. This is some information about us here at the West Center. We've got this slide, we've got another one at the end. If you have any questions about us, our day program or respite care, you can give us a call. So let's get started because we've got a lot to cover with the early stages. There's a ton of information in this and you will get, uh, you will have access to the slides just like you'll have access to the recording because uh, I know lots of you like to take an awful lot of notes and that is good. I'm a note taker myself. So I want you to think about a few things. These are kind of our key messages as we go through here. What we want to focus on on the early stages of dementia is that we allow them to remain as independent as possible and that they keep their dignity. We're going to use the word normalization a lot because that's really the stage that this is. We're going to call this normalization. That middle stage we're going to call supportive, and that late stage we're going to call sensory. But this early stage we're going to call normalization. That's what we as the caregivers are going to focus on, whether we're a professional caregiver or we are a family caregiver. They're going to start having some difficulties with their ADLs. That's those activities of daily living. And we're going to talk about why. We're going to look at the why on each of these. But they are going to be able to still do those things, brush their teeth, shower, feed themselves, toilet themselves, but they're going to start needing some assistance. There's a lot of sequencing involved in each of those things. And during this time, what you may see is that physical activity may actually improve cognitive thinking, physical fitness, and mood. It doesn't cure dementia, 
But any time that we can push that oxygenated blood up to the brain, this is good for us too, by the way. We just become a little more clear. Some of the things that happen for the care partner or for that caregiver, we're going to discuss also. In the earlier stages, assistance is provided with transportation and with housekeeping. And of course, later in the disease, they are going to become total care or full care. So here's some of our goals earlier in the disease. Is we want to make sure and provide symptom relief. We want to make sure throughout the course of dementia that they are as comfortable as possible. And rather than focus on what they lose as they are losing the ability to do certain things, we want to stay focused throughout the course of the disease on what remains. We want to maximize and focus on those abilities and skills that remain. Probably during the first part of the disease, we as the caregivers and care partners are going to have to take over the management of medications, as well as help them manage other medical conditions. Let's talk about why is this happening. Now, we do not know why some people get dementia and some don't. Most of the time, whenever we're teaching about dementia, what the general public knows about the disease is very, very little. Memory loss, that's usually about it. What's happening to the brain is that it is actually, no matter what type of dementia it is, and keep in mind there's over 130 different kinds, types, forms of dementia. Alzheimer's being the most common type of dementia. But that brain is beginning to atrophy. The brain's literally beginning to die. The cells wither and they die. It starts to shrink from about three pounds down to one pound. And that is why they lose the abilities. Let's look at this brain. How can we expect the person on the right to act like the person on the left? They can't. They would if they could. This is, these are actual brain photos here. Look at the difference in these brains. Now, this one just happens to be, the one on the right, someone who died from the end stages of Alzheimer's disease. The one on the left is somebody the same age who died in a car accident. Normal three-pound brain versus a one-pound brain the brain cells begin to die. Now, I want you to think right now, when you hear the word dementia, just in your mind right now, picture dementia. What does that look like to you? What ages are you associating it with? And you can put it in the chat if you want to, or you can just be thinking about it. When you first hear dementia, we're going to talk about dementia. What comes to mind? I found this fantastic three-minute video about what is dementia and what does dementia look like. So I think this is a great way for us to get started. There were times where um, coming home from work, I got lost. I ended up calling my wife saying, I don't know what I have. <laughs> A lot of it is just confusion. You hit these moments of thought. When I left the house, I went to church and I had my clothes inside out. I didn't see it at all. My memory just blanks out. If you picture a Christmas tree with lights, one starts to flicker a little bit. And you go over and you tap it and it goes back on. But then eventually that one that was flickering doesn't go on anymore. To me, that's what dementia is like. Dementia is an umbrella that covers many, many different types of cognitive impairments of brain diseases. Your memory changes, your emotion changes, personality changes, and then you start with confusion and disorientation. For us to finally get the diagnosis took about a year and a half. Process of elimination, is it depression, is it Lyme disease? 
an infection in the brain. You don't know what the heck is wrong with you, but you know something's wrong. When I got diagnosed, it felt like someone had punched me in the gut. Literally, it just overwhelmed me. I went through a horrible depression thinking life, life is over for me. I'm sorry. The last thing on my mind was that I'd be dealing with what I'm dealing with right now. I would do anything to go back. But I'm not the same person I was. There is no proof that any medication will slow down dementia. There are many research drugs out there. There's no proof that any of them are doing anything. There's no hope for a cure right now, but there is hope. There is hope. Nobody wakes up the day after they get a diagnosis and all of a sudden they're in stage. This disease is a progression. Just because I have dementia doesn't mean that my life is over or that I don't want to contribute to my community, society in general, or, or especially my family. Maybe I can't do everything I used to do the same way, but I can still do a lot. But we have to figure out how to do them differently, which means figuring out how to overcome the obstacles. When you come to a bump in the road in your life, you have two choices. You can either move forward or you can stay stuck. I realized that I still was a valuable person. You know, get your ass up out of bed and, and live. I'm trying as hard as I can, living a meaningful, purposeful life. I don't want just to survive dementia. <laughs> I want to thrive. I want those happy times to continue as long as they can. I thought that was really powerful because it makes us see dementia probably in a way that maybe you weren't picturing it in your mind. The three people that are in that video may not have been what came to your mind when you thought of dementia. Now, there were a couple of things that were said that I want to point out. You heard her mention the Christmas tree, and I've heard dementia compared to that Christmas tree before, where when that first light goes out, she said you can tap it and sometimes it'll come back on. Or you might even kind of move the tree where you don't see the light that's out. But eventually, as the other lights start to go out, you can't hide it. You can't change it anymore. And over time, all of the lights start to dim. It's a great way to think of the disease. She also said the word umbrella, that dementia is an umbrella term, which it is. Dementia is an umbrella term, like cancer is an umbrella term. And then under that umbrella, there's these over 130 different types of dementia. You heard the gentleman say that his just getting diagnosed took so much time because it was a process of elimination. And the younger a person is, it can even take longer because who's thinking it's dementia when someone comes in and they're 48? Who's thinking it's dementia when someone comes in and they're 52? And they eliminate these other diseases. Now, for it to be an early onset, early onset means that someone's diagnosed before the age of 65 early onset. We're talking about the early stages, early stages of the disease, but the word early onset means that they were diagnosed before the age of 65. You also heard the woman in the video talk about thriving with dementia, living well with dementia, and it can be done. That's what we are about here at the West Center, and it can most definitely be done, but we've got to know how to do it. I mentioned before, what we want to do in the earliest stages of the disease is prolong independence. Now, some of the things we've got to think about as you look here on this page, driving, working, managing medications, managing finances, living alone, traveling, you've got to think about the risk. Caregivers also have to start making decisions. Caregivers have to start making decisions for themselves and for their loved one. They have to be thinking ahead because this is a progressive terminal disease. All of the dementias, 
progressive terminal diseases. So we have to think ahead to living arrangements, finances, work, eventually living in an assisted living or skilled nursing. Earlier in the disease, we want the person who is living with dementia to be able to make decisions for themselves, especially things like picking out their clothes. Now, we may have to go in and get rid of some things in the closet so that there's not 50 items hanging. Maybe there's just 10. And some of the things you may see early in the disease is they may come out in clothes that don't match, but they can still most definitely dress themselves. When they sit down to eat, they may not eat the food that's in front of them in the order that we typically would eat it in, but they still eat and they can still feed themselves. Now, most of the time, once somebody has a diagnosis of dementia, the doctor is likely going to ask them to stop driving. This is all very individualized, though. I certainly know people who still drive into a little further into the disease. So it is all very individualized. I know when I worked at the Alzheimer's Association, though, we suggested that once there was a diagnosis that they stop driving. Managing medications. Earlier in the disease, sometimes people will forget that they already took their medicine, they'll take it again or they just don't take it at all. As far as finances go, this is when, and we're all at risk for scams, but this is a person that could really easily be taken advantage of. They also may not pay their bills or they may pay them more than once the same bill. And then that idea of living alone, how long is somebody going to be able to live alone? Eventually, there's going to be falls with dementia because the person who has dementia is going back to the person they originally were. Those of you who are on our programs a lot have heard me say that before. The person with dementia is going back, back, back. It's called the theory of retrogenesis to the person they were. And we originally, we were not walking, we were not talking, we were not feeding ourselves, we were not toileting ourselves. And that's where they're headed. And when we first learned to walk, there were a lot of falls. And when we stopped walking, there's a lot of falls. So if somebody's living by themselves, we've got to think about these things. We have to weigh the risk. There is dignity in risk. We've got to keep that in mind. There's dignity with risk. And we think what is worth it. Now, we cannot bubble wrap our loved ones. I've had people come to me and honestly say, I want you to guarantee me that they will not fall. Well, we can't do that. And typically when I say back to them something like, I can't put your loved one in bubble wrap. And we get down, it's just fear. We're coming from fear. We're not going to make a big deal out of wearing mismatched clothes. It's not a big deal. And those of you who are further in the disease or you work in the field and you see it further down the line, it truly isn't a big deal. Let's look at some of those early abilities and decisions. Keep in mind that nobody likes to be told what to do. Nobody. And that includes somebody who has dementia. We can't just go in and take over. We've got to have some help making these decisions. Now, you can actually have a driving test done by the Department of Public Safety. It takes the blame off of you. You can have the doctor write a note. You can have them write it on a prescription pad. That works for a lot of people. They may also be in denial. Because imagine getting this type of news. You heard the people on the video where they talked about the depression that came with it. And there's some people who will just block it out. There's nothing wrong with me. It's you. There's nothing wrong with me. It's all you. And that's how they're dealing with it. These decisions are really hard in the early stages. 
They're hard on the person with dementia and they are really hard on the person, on the family. But think about, let's use empathy, stand in the shoes of the person who has dementia. Their independence is being taken away. And if they know anything about this disease, they know what's coming. The person with dementia can even have what's called anticipatory grief. We as the loved ones certainly have anticipatory grief, but we're grieving the future that hasn't even happened yet. And taking those keys away is one of the hardest things we can do. Think about how long you've been driving. Those of you who grew up in a small town like I did, goodness gracious, I was probably driving when I was 12, back roads. I learned to drive very, very early. Everybody did. And then let's say at 60, 70, 75, somebody comes and tells me that I don't know what I'm doing or that they're going to take my keys because I'm not a safe driver anymore. And we have someone whose brain is starting to look like that brain that we looked at earlier, and they can't control their emotions. And they may have what some people would call a challenging behavior. We here at the West Center have really stopped using the word behavior, and we are trying to say they're having a challenging expression. They're doing the best they can with what remains. And it can come out as anger. It can come out as a fist. It could come out as some words they've never used before. They're all saying the same thing. I'm losing my independence. And you're the one enforcing it, so I'm going to take it out on you. Remember, nobody likes to be told what to do. So these difficult expressions can show up early in the disease. Anger is one of the easiest emotions, if not the easiest emotion for us to have. You heard me say earlier that theory of retrogenesis where they're kind of going back in time. And what happens to a three, four, five-year-old when they get told what to do and they don't want to do it? They might have a tantrum. They might do or say things they normally wouldn't do or say because they can't regulate their emotions yet. The filter in the brain that is right in this area gets so damaged that again, they will do and say things they normally would not do or say. So some of the things that we will do that we wanna make sure to do as the caregivers, the care partner, is to make those doctor's appointments for them Try to keep them socially active. This is where day programs can really be a lot of help. A day program specific for people with dementia. Call their friends and have their friends continue to come over and take them out as long as they can. Remember what we said earlier, normalization. Normalization. If they've always gone to play golf, continue to go play golf. They may not play it in the same way, but they're still getting that socialization. Create opportunities for them to stay connected and for them to still have their independence. We mentioned earlier about the denial because they will develop a, a lack of self-awareness. And again, with the things that they say and do. They may be very resistant to care if we go in and we try to do too much too fast. I share uh, all of the stories that I share. These families know that I share them, and so I certainly have permission. But early in the disease, I had someone on one of my support groups whose husband had always been able to just go into the bathroom in the morning and get ready for the day. And she walked in one day, and he had toothpaste all over his face, and he was shaving. Now think about this. He could still shave. He still knew what to do. There was just too much stuff on the vanity. And he knew he needed to put something on his face. And she came on the support group and through tears, 
she had to laugh. And she said he smelled so good, he just was minty fresh all day long. But she realized at that moment that she had to accommodate the disease more. She had to go in and lay out the toothpaste and the toothbrush, and then he would brush his teeth. She would put that away and lay out the shaving cream and the razor, and then he would shave. She would put that away and because he could still do it all. But she had to accommodate the disease to allow him to be independent because she could have gone in there and said, I'm going to have to help you with your, now I have. She didn't do that. She knew what to do because of classes like this and from being in the support groups as well. Other things that happen is depression. Depression and dementia just about go hand in hand at the beginning of the disease, and then we see it again in the later stages of the disease, which we'll talk about in a couple of months. So let's look at some general strategies in the early stages. Some things that the caregiver can use to help maximize a person's abilities and skills. So one of the things I've already mentioned is keeping them socially active, using a day program, continuing to call on friends, continuing to go to church. So let me take a drink. I've told this before also. I used to have somebody who was one of my clients who wanted to go to church. Her husband wanted to go to church, but he would not wear anything other than pajama pants. He would put on a button-up shirt, he'd put on a tie, and he'd have on his pajama pants. And she said, I can't take him to church like that. Oh, my goodness, we can't leave the house. And I said, why? Why can you not go to church in pajama pants? Of all places you should be able to go, you should be able to go to church in pajama pants. If you can't, you're at the wrong church. He needed to still be social. She needed to be social. He didn't want to wear regular pants. Who cares? You may find that your loved one wants to wear their boots to bed. Who cares? Let them wear their boots to bed. And we seriously have to get to that point. Cognitive stimulation. Those of you who came on early, we were doing some reminiscence therapy. We were talking about Gibson's Discount Center and TG&Y and Montgomery Wards. And for many of us, we were having sensory memories. We talked about SNH green stamps and licking the back of them. And some of you, like me, can taste it. And you can remember licking it till you just couldn't lick anymore. Those are sensory memories. Those are long-term memories. And those stay in a person who has dementia. In some people, it stays the entire time. But if we can do reminiscence therapy... We have an entire program on reminiscence therapy that you can find on our YouTube page. You can also look up reminiscence therapy using their story from their past without using the word remember. You may have noticed even when I was talking to you earlier, I didn't say, do you remember Montgomery Wards? I said, I was thinking about when I used to work at Montgomery Ward. And then other people would say, I worked at Montgomery Ward. I know about Dairy Queen. I did. And I never said, do you remember? So we don't want to use the word remember with somebody with dementia. We've mentioned physical activity and making sure that we're keeping them as physically active as we can. Communication where we can make their appointments for them. That sensory stimulation. Music's going to be important all the way through this disease. Um, art bright light, light therapy. There's actually lights that you can use. I have one right here on my desk called Happy Lights. And those are really good in the fall and in the winter or if they're not getting out of the house much. And you might even use a white noise machine just to have that um, in the background. I have one in my office right now. I don't know if you can hear it. Environmental changes, we're going to do things in the house to get rid of shadows because particularly later in the day, like right now, there might be shadows and they may see that shadow as being something in the floor or being someone standing up against the wall. All of their senses are going to start to change. Get rid of anything that can be a fall hazard. 
We're going to simplify everything that we can. And then as the caregiver, as the care partner, we want to start getting as much education as we possibly can as soon as we can so that we are better able to go on this journey with our loved one and offer that education and that support to family and friends as well. Some of the things by engaging a person with dementia, we've talked about getting social support, uh, focusing on their current skills and not their past skills, and then recognize the environmental influences affecting the person's living with dementia. And we'll look at those a little bit more. Let's talk a little more about activity, physical activity. We said earlier that it can actually, as they are pushing that oxygenated blood up to the brain, you may have the time that you're thinking they are better, they're better. It's that they're a little more clear. If you can think of it like a fog, and we're going to watch a video in just a minute that kind of describes, in fact, the beginning of the other video, they talked about a fog and that there were times that the fog was heavier than others. And think what is physical activity. It's taking a walk. It's dancing. And I've had an awful lot of folks, especially in the day program, say, oh, my daddy won't dance. He's the Baptist. There's no way he'll dance. And then I'm sending him a video of daddy dancing. Something about dementia loves music because music stays. The side of the brain where music is stored remains longer than the other side of the brain. And we do love to dance gardening, walking the dog, yoga, chair yoga, laughter yoga. There's all types of yoga to do. So we're not just talking about what you might think of when you hear the word exercise. There's lots and lots of studies on this about how activity positively affects cognitive function. The other things that you can do are just activities with repetitive motions. A person with dementia, just like they may start to repeat the same words or phrases over and over, many times will soothe themselves by doing things with a repetitive motion, like folding towels, putting coins in a coin holder, separating nuts and bolts. If they still have their fine motor skills earlier in the disease, being able to do, uh, separate beads, anything like that, even if they're folding the same stack of towels over and over and over again. It's a repetitive motion. I've had people who want to put paper through a paper shredder. Repetitive motion. It's giving them meaning, it's giving them purpose, and it's repetitive, so it's self-soothing. Just like we might rock, some of you right now might have your lead going. You might be taking a pen or a pencil and you're doing this with it. You're doing a repetitive motion because of the self-soothing. People with dementia do the same thing. Let's watch this next short video. And this is frequently asked questions about the early stages of dementia. Even though receiving the diagnosis of Alzheimer's or dementia is something that can be difficult, it also in a way can be a relief once you have a diagnosis so that you are able to, to take the steps necessary to reach out and find the resources that will help your loved one the most. Caregivers really are in, in, in dire need of support as they're taking care of their loved ones um, with early stage dementia because you're navigating new territory you've likely never dealt with before and you don't know what to expect. And it really helps to be around people that have already gone down the road. It was hard for us to talk about. You have to come to terms with something like this. You don't expect it at a young age. And so we didn't talk about it. And now I'm just not shy about it. If someone comes to my yard sale, I somehow bring it up. I just, partly because I just want to find those other people. I thought I need to go to a support group. That's what I do once a month. And it's people that some are caring from their parent or, or a spouse or, you know, it's just been a variety of people. And we share 
situations where we are and you learn from each other because people are maybe in a different place in the disease and you're seeing something that maybe you need to be aware of that it might happen and what you should be doing instead of having it hit you so suddenly and like now what do I do when somebody has been recently diagnosed and they are in the early stages of uh, dementia it's really important to go ahead and have some difficult conversations because you want to take advantage of this window while you have it to have the conversations about things that matter and you need to go ahead and talk about the financial issues or the legal issues or, or the medical wishes um, while you can still have the conversation and, and you feel completely confident that your loved one is making part of the decision. I think communication um, with your family members or friends with early stage dementia is, is a really critical element that you have to learn how to do correctly because it helps the relationship uh, between people flourish because otherwise um, angry things are liable to be said and miscommunication can happen. And I think the most important thing is to just take your time and listen. You have to slow down and you really have to just take the time to hear what they're saying. And it's so important not to question so much and not to say, do you remember? Why didn't you remember this? You know, don't be critical. Try to keep everything in very positive terms. And if you want to talk about something about when they were little, if, if you're thinking, gee, I wonder if they remember what the tree was like, or I wonder if they remember the house we lived in, um, you start the conversation and you say, gee, mom, I remember when I was little in the house we lived in, they had those blue walls, the house was just great. And then just let them continue with the story. That's really the best thing to do because if you start a dialogue, they will jump in and they will be a part of it. And then if you start something, and it doesn't seem to connect with them, that's okay. Just move on and try something else. An engagement activity that could be great for your loved one if they've just been recently diagnosed with early stage dementia is trying new things because they're so capable of trying new things and, and learning how to do new things, whether or not, you know, you don't necessarily have to master something, but, I think that that also gives you the opportunity to talk about something different that you tried and it, and it's stimulating. You try something new and then you have a discussion. You're able to process that with your loved one and create a connection. They can all do things they didn't know they could do. <laughs> they can lift weights. They can dance. Many of these are things that they've never done or they will tell you, oh, I used to do that. And they think now that they can't do it anymore. And that's just not true. If you meet them where they're at, they can do it. It's in a new way because none of us are the same as we were 10 years ago. But we can work with where they're at today and help them find joy and wellness in the face of the challenges that they have. It's important after diagnosis to remember your family member may be going through some changes and they may not seem exactly like the same person they used to be, but it's so important to remember that if this is your husband, he's still your husband. And this man is still the man he always has been. He may be going through some challenges and it may seem like he's different, but he's not, he's the same man. And it's really important to hang on to that and, and hang on to the things that you have done in the past and that you enjoy doing together and, and keep doing those, keep doing those as long as you can. And I try to just take one day at a time. I don't try to worry about, you know, what's gonna happen to me, what's gonna happen to him, who knows? And why am I gonna worry about it? <laughs> can't do anything about it anyway. just enjoy the moment. Another, oh, that is so, it is so well done. Everything that is said in that video, I want to touch on a couple of things that were said there. You heard her talking about a support group and plugging into a support group to be able to realize I am not the only person going through this. 
oh, okay, that person does stuff just like my husband or my mom. I've got people who come on my support groups. We have two online and one in person. And some people never say a word, but they'll shoot me an email every once in a while and just say, it means so much to me to know I'm not alone. I've had people say things like, I found my family. I found my tribe. I've got other people. I can come and say things in this safe group that I can't say to my family. It is important to plug into a group. I do want to talk about why their language changes. We looked at that brain and you saw um, that there actually were holes in that brain earlier. And again, you're going to get these slides, so you'll, you'll have all of it. The left language leaves. That's our day-to-day -day language. And that language is the language that leaves. It's the language associated with the hippocampus, the facts, the day-to-day -day language. Pen, table, chair, boy, light. But the right language stays. So right remains. And the right that remains is the rhythmic language. So right rhythm remains. We've talked about music. Music remains, poetry remains, prayer remains for a very, very long time. And some people, it remains all the way through the disease. But unfortunately, there's three other things that store on the right because they are not day-to-day -day language. When we were growing up and we first heard racial slurs and curse words and sex talk, we did not use those as day-to-day -day language. In fact, somebody told us that we'd get in trouble if we used those as day-to-day -day language. So they didn't store over here on the left. They stored on the right and they remain. And that's why people will use words that they never, ever used before. Where we have to go with that is what need are they trying to get met? They've got an unmet need. And they're using the words that remain to have to get a need met. So they may say things they've never said before. You also heard them in the video talking about slow down. As the disease progresses, it can take up to 20 seconds for them to fully hear what we said, have it commute in there and then for them to be able to do what we've asked them to do. Now, earlier in the disease, it may only be about eight to 10 seconds. That's still a long time, eight to 10 seconds, because we tend to want somebody to act fast right now. She mentioned starting dialogue. And I said reminiscence therapy earlier. You can actually purchase reminiscence cards or you can make reminiscence cards to where you pick it up and you look at it and go, oh my goodness, I was just looking at this picture here. What is this? And it may be a picture of a car that they had a long time ago. Or I used one one time when I was talking with some ladies, it was a Shirley Temple doll. And I was saying, what is this? Who is that? Now I knew who it was, but I was pretending that I didn't so that they'd tell me their stories. Reminiscence therapy. We want to continue to make connections. And then you heard that wife say, I do this one day at a time. One day at a time. This slide says, this is normalization. We're going to make the best of the situation, but we're going to prepare for the future. Normalization is making things as normal as possible. And we want to make sure we establish a routine. Throughout the course of a, the disease, a person with dementia is going to do better with a routine. But if we can get that established early. So here are some things that you might expect to see in the early stages of the disease. They may have long periods of time where they're really good that you're going, you may even think maybe they're misdiagnosed. They're going to still be able to use humor. They're going to still be able to hide this disease, especially in social circumstances, for a long time. If they had a job where they had to be social, I had a gentleman who was an insurance salesman. Every time he'd come by somebody, he'd stick that hand out and say, hello, my name is Jim. Hello, my name is Jim. He was being an insurance salesman. 
but he would come right back by in about 90 seconds. Hello, my name is Jim. But he could do the social banter and the chit chat. Again, anger, it can come out as anger, even in social situations. They may start to have problems in a demanding situation at work, if they're still working, or at a task where I really have to concentrate or think using a cell phone. That's pretty new learning. Most of us can remember a time before we had these things. And at times during this early stage, they may seem completely confused, like the gentleman in with the vanity, and he's just looking at everything. I know I'm supposed to be doing something, but what am I supposed to be doing? They also may not be self-aware, and they don't even recognize the illness in themselves. You heard the gentleman on the first video who said he went to church with all of his clothes on inside out, and he had no idea until his family told him. How long has he been dressing himself? And he did not realize it. He had a lack of self-awareness. Again, social skills are going to remain for some time. Social skills will remain. Now, you may see them start to do things like use the words thing and stuff an awful lot. You know the thing, the stuff. I'm looking for the thing. You know the thing. What we can say to that then is tell me about the thing. What does the thing do? Show me the thing instead of getting mad or upset. What's the name of the thing? Well, they don't know the name of the thing or they would say it. And they expect us to be able to figure out what it is that they're talking about. Their personality may start to change. They can be easily irritable, angry again, and they may even have some mood swings. But again, in these early stages, there are times when they're going to make a connection and it's going to be like they are just there. And then there's times that, that it just doesn't connect. Think about that Christmas tree and that light just starting to dim. You tap it and there it is again. Maybe they didn't sleep well. Maybe they didn't take their medication. Maybe they didn't eat or maybe they got upset about something. And then you see more of these things. And you notice it says good and bad days. And when people ask you how your loved one's doing, that's what I recommend you say. You know what? We have good and bad days. Because with this disease, there's never going to be a day that we say something like, they're getting better. We're trying this new treatment. But we can honestly say we have good and bad days. Some days are better than others. That's my go-to. Some days are better than others. Those mood swings that they may have usually stem from frustration. You're also going to notice their attention may seem to be a little bit short. And typically their immediate recall will be lost first. An immediate recall is what we just did or what we just talked about. So if I said something like, um, hey, mom, go in there and get your blue jacket. Come on, it's time to go. Go get your blue jacket. And she walked in the kitchen and there's cookies on the counter. And in two minutes, she's not back. And I go in and she's just eating the cookies. And I say, I told you to go get your blue jacket. What blue jacket? A person with dementia can have one thought at a time. Only one. And once those cookies were in sight and my mouth and I'm smelling them and I'm touched, that blue jacket's gone. One thought at a time. Not only are they going to lose their words to be able to say their words, but they may not understand the words that we are saying. So we may have to start leaving out adjectives and adverbs and bring those sentences down three to five words. They may not be aware of their own body or their body position, and they're less able to locate and express pain. So they may be sitting with a furrowed brow, holding their stomach, and you say, is your stomach hurting? And they say, no. But their body's telling us something different. 
they're saying my body is hurting. My stomach is hurting. I don't know how to get those words out to tell you that, but their body will tell you. Sequencing is lost, the order in which we do things. And this can be getting in and out of a car, putting on clothes. There's a lot of steps to that. We talked about fine motor skills being lost, initiation, and not being able to make their needs known. But what's preserved? Let's look at those things that are preserved. Because we've said we want to focus on what remains. We don't focus on what's lost. We focus on what remains. Those long ago memories, that's why we use reminiscence therapy. Confabulation, confabulation, sometimes people will call that a lie, but confabulation and lies are not the same thing. A lie is something we do intentionally. I'm going to intentionally tell you this story that I made up because I don't want to get in trouble or because I want you to believe such and such. But confabulation is a story that we tell to continue to fit in. So when I have a gentleman come in my office and look at my degrees on the wall and he starts telling me about his degrees, he's just finding something to talk to me about. And he sees those and he thinks he has them too. That's not a lie. That's confabulation. We go with it. Tell me about your degrees. Tell me about your school. Well, he never went to school. But he may be able to tell me a story. And we're able to have a connection. And that's one of the biggest things with dementia. The more we connect, the more they trust us. And that's going to help when they're starting to have those challenging expressions they are still going to be able to understand your facial expressions, your tone, and your gestures all the way till the end of the disease because their amygdala is going to stay intact. And that's something we'll talk about in one of the other uh, programs. The hippocampus is dying, but the amygdala is staying intact. They can still do activities. We may just have to cue them. They'll definitely be able to sing they will be able to swear, use sex words and forbidden words, racial slurs. They still have those social skills, which I see the typo there. And they can usually make their own decisions if we give them time. I think this is our last video, but I want us to take a look at uh, these folks talking about what it is like living with dementia. Early stage. I am 66. I was diagnosed when I was 65. I was diagnosed initially in November of 2015. And I think I'm getting the dates right. Part of my issue is my dates sometimes mush together. I know exactly what we're doing. Um, I know you're Steve. I know you're Zach. We're here in Pine Street, finally. <laughs> On July 20th of last year, I received the official diagnosis with 17 research physicians and doctors in the room, myself, my husband, and my two children with the diagnosis of early onset, early stage Alzheimer's. Every time I say it. The way I explain it to people is I am in a new life. I, my former life no longer exists and it's up to me to create a new life. I knew something was wrong. It's not normal to not be able to calculate a tip anymore. It's not normal to not do math in your head and to be able to subtract or add numbers. It's not normal to not remember conversations or to attend a training class and not remember what was taught. More and more words are going away. And there are a number of words that no matter how I remember them, they are not there. You know, I can say, okay, now I've got it. And two, two minutes later, I won't have it. With Alzheimer's, you, you don't have an option. You just, it's just not there. The information is just gone. It seems to be particularly difficult for those of us with Alzheimer's early onset to have um, sorry, I got a little bit, um, frustrating is the word that comes to mind. I am frustrated with the fact that I don't know what 32 minus seven is without a pen and paper. 
it frustrates me that I have no idea what today is, but I do know it's Friday. First thing I lost was my car. So I was no longer able to use my car for various reasons. I got a bicycle and I've had two crashes with that. Um, and I think part of that is spatial. Now I have a new job and that job is to be loud and proud about my disease, to share my symptoms with everyone and anyone who will listen to me. I'm able to be useful. I'm able to have to surround myself with a lot of people, which is absolutely the most important thing you can do with, with Alzheimer's. Everyone always tells me I look good. Well, what does that have to do with anything? I keep saying to people, I'm going to walk around in a bathroom with a towel on my head. You know, no makeup, just an old hag. And then maybe then they'll think I have Alzheimer's. But this is what Alzheimer's looks like. It looks like me. My name is Chris Hannafin. My name is Pam Montana. And this is my brief but spectacular take. Brief but spectacular take. On living with Alzheimer's. Wow, that's powerful. How powerful is that for them to be able to talk and for them to be willing to share? For so long, the dementias have been something that it's almost like there was a shame attached to it. We didn't talk about it. And it's time to talk about it. I'm so glad that the Alzheimer's Association has made that video. They also offer for people early in the disease to be able to make videos about what they want their final wishes to be. To make videos that caregivers down the road will be able to look at and see what's important to me. I watched one where a gentleman said, uh, you know, to make sure and leave a fan on at night because I've always slept with a fan. And if I don't have that fan on, I might get agitated. Isn't that important to know later? down the road, his caregivers need to know that. And they're making these great videos and it's things that people can do at home themselves. I just think that's so powerful. So more on what to expect. And you've heard in those videos, people talking about being able to make plans, being able to make decisions and being able to have some hard conversations about finances, about medical decisions, about that paperwork. What are we going to do with our time? Are we going to have that bucket list? Are we going to take some trips? What medications are we going to do? But to actually sit down and have the talks with family. Being able to tell family, being able to tell friends how to start educating them as well. I do want us to briefly look at dementia medications. You heard it said in one of the videos, there is no, you'll see these called memory meds, but nothing cures dementia. There's nothing out yet that can cure dementia. But what all of these medications do is they help alleviate some of the symptoms. They call them memory meds, but these really could be called symptom meds because these medications in some people can help alleviate some of the symptoms. So these are medications that are approved for one type of dementia or another. Uh, and it may not be appropriate for other types of dementia. So you may see there, oh, there's something called an amenda. Uh, that's why you talk to your uh, physician about that, to see if that is something that would work with your loved one. Some of these medications, I know with the Aricept, some people can't take it because of what it does to their stomach. Um, and you can see they're approved for all stages, mild to moderate, moderate to severe. Now, one thing they have found out, because I will talk to families whose loved ones have been on medications for years, but what they have found out is that actually, they typically work for about 18 to 36 months, 18 to 36 months. And then we will generally start to come off with those medications. If we see a big change, we can go right back on them. But normally they work about 18 to 36 months. 
here's some more information about medication. The earlier we can start the medication, better. It's kind of like it, um, I've heard people mention it's like they ride those plateaus longer because we know about dementia is they'll sit on that plateau and then they'll progress and they'll plateau and then they'll progress. Now, sometimes things can put them in a progression, a urinary tract infection, the flu, COVID, pneumonia, a really bad fall. God forbid they have to have general anesthesia. General anesthesia is going to send them to that next stage. But many times you can ride that plateau for a really long time. Now, they may have other medications that get prescribed for depression. You heard me mention earlier, earlier stage dementia and depression tend to go hand in hand. They may be on an anti-anxiety. They may be on something to help them sleep. A lot of folks end up taking, uh, starting out with melatonin, and they may have to work into something that helps them at night or even with their appetite. Uh, but common side effects to these memory meds, nausea is number one, stomach pain and diarrhea, those type things. And some people just can't take them. Some of the things that as the caregiver we want to keep is that health journal. I encourage families to start carrying. I've got one right here. I like this size. I don't know if you can see it. It is a notebook size that'll just fit in your purse or that it's easy to keep up with. And to write down dates and times and symptoms or challenging behaviors or expressions that they see. So that when you go to the doctor and you only have that 15 or 20 minutes, you're not sitting there trying to go, well, he always this, or he never that. We don't want to use always and never. Let's look at specifically. Okay, four times this week, he. Three times this week, she. But if you keep that journal, it'll help you. It'll help your doctors as well making sure that you're keeping up with all of their appointments and having that medication list. We talked about routines earlier, and this has been one of the best things that I've had families use is a whiteboard, putting their routine up on a whiteboard because earlier in the disease, they'll still be able to read and comprehend. And so having a whiteboard is something that is suggested. Now, keep in mind that they're going to be able to read longer than they're going to be able to comprehend. So there will be a time that they'll be able to read the words, but they can't tell you what it is that they have read. We want to have a schedule that doesn't just say watching TV and napping. And that's what a lot of folks end up doing at home is watching TV and napping and then they start to pace and then they start to rummage and it's out of boredom that they're doing those things. They may also start to have more sundowning syndrome. So we need to find things that we can do to fill the day. Something that helps them feel like they are contributing, they are staying busy, they still have a purpose, they still have a meaning. And we've talked about things like folding the clothes, sweeping, being able to do things around the house as much as possible. Allow them to cook. Help them decide what to eat, what are we going to need, what's our prep going to look like, and we're going to look at a case study next that has to do with cooking. So let's look at this case study and what we could do about this particular situation. So Joellen was once an excellent cook. She's beginning to experience difficulty in the kitchen. Her husband and primary caregiver is taking over many of the duties in the kitchen. His main challenge is how to keep his wife safely engaged in a task she has previously enjoyed doing and in which she was once quite accomplished. The problem is that she's at risk of causing potentially dangerous situations, like putting a metal bowl in the microwave or putting a dish towel on the burner or even leaving the stove on. So she used to be able to go in the kitchen and just do anything and everything. She still needs to be able to go in the kitchen. We talked about normalization. So what is the problem? What is the husband going to do? He arranges for them to cook meals together. So does that mean it's going to take more of his time? It does. He's going to provide the supervision. He's going to ask Joellen to contribute by taking specific steps like washing the fruit washing the vegetables, assembling the salad, and having her assist with the other mealtime task outside of the kitchen, set the table. She is still going to very much be a part of it, 
but he's going to break down those steps for her. Let's talk about communication in the early stages of the disease. We mentioned earlier that it can take, at the end of the disease, it can take up to 20 seconds for them to fully hear what we said, comprehend, and then do what we're asking them to do. Earlier in the disease, it can be eight to 10 seconds. But again, eight to 10 seconds is a long time when you're just with quiet. They need that quiet though. They don't need us to say it again. They don't need us to say it louder. They don't need us to say it in a different way. In fact, we need to say it the same way each time. Use that calm voice, a reassuring voice, and watch your tone. We never want to offer more than two choices at a time. This is why a menu can become a real problem in a restaurant. So think about what we do. We're sitting there with our menu. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say to my mom, oh, that hamburger looks really good. Or maybe the steak. Let's see, the hamburger or the steak. I'm having the hamburger. Which would you like to have? Nine times out of 10, she's going to have the hamburger. If we just narrow it down to two, but we don't make it about them. We're not going to make it about them. Identify others if they're having a hard time remembering somebody's name, but we're not going to say, remember, mom, this is so-and-so. But what I might say is, hey, Tom, how you doing? Good to see you again. Mom, here's Tom. And, and we just keep going. Not remember, mom, here's Tom. You can help them find the appropriate words for self-expression. Show me. Tell me. What does it do? if they can't find the word. And you can provide touch. This is called compassionate touch. Because many times with this disease, and we're going to talk about it in the middle stages, and we're really going to talk about it in the late stages, we stop touching them except when we're providing care. And they're going to need it more and more. We don't stop touching a newborn. We don't stop touching a toddler. Theory of retrogenesis, they're going back in time. They need more positive, compassionate touch. I've said this before. We do not want to use that word remember. In fact, we want to get that out of our vocabulary. When we are working with people that have dementia or we have a loved one with dementia, we need to stop using this word. It can be done. It's hard to do. But once you stop using it, you won't ever use it again. You find another way to say it. I teach our students and therapy students, physical therapy, occupational therapy, are really bad about saying, remember yesterday when we, well, I wasn't even here yesterday, you stupid, is what I might get. But what if I showed you some pictures of my granddaughter? She is the cutest thing you want to see her. I got some pictures right here. While we're over here, I was going to show you this. And I just start right into the exercise or whatever it is that I'm needing them to do. But I didn't just automatically go up and ask them to do something. I got them interested in this picture of this precious little baby. I never use the word remember. I might say something like, it's good to see you again. Because what did I just say? You know me. It's good to see you again. Call them by name. One of our favorite words becomes okay. Okay, but in the tone that they're using to us. Okay does not mean you're right. Okay means I heard you. It's active listening. It's validation therapy. If they say something like, you're the one that took all my money. Okay. Well, let me get that fixed. I didn't say, okay. And I didn't say, what are you talking about? I didn't take your money. I mirrored their emotion and their feeling, but then I said, I will fix it. You're the one that took all my money. Okay, sit down. I'm calling the bank. Let me get on the phone right now. And I may pick up my desk phone and call my cell phone. These are called therapeutic stories. Therapeutic stories, the Alzheimer's Association calls them fiblets. And some people just say their lies. 
I like to call them therapeutic stories. If they're looking for someone who's passed away, like their mom or dad, and their mom or dad's been gone for many, many years, I'm not going to tell somebody over and over and over again every single day that a person has died. It's the first time they heard it. But I might say something like, tell me about your mom. Or tell me about your dad. Tell me about your husband. And sometimes we have to tell that therapeutic story that they've run to the store. Or he's out golfing. You know how he does. And sometimes he's even deployed. Whatever works for them. And if somebody is starting to get upset or maybe starting to have one of those challenging expressions or behaviors, there's four things that we can use for distractions that tend to work really well. And the first one is food. The sweeter, the better. With dementia, we talked about their senses are going to be changing and taste changes. And for most people, not everybody, but most everybody, sweet stays. So if I've got little cups of ice cream, and if you're in Texas, you know we've got to have some Bluebell ice cream. Or I can go to the Sonic or the Dairy Queen, and I can get a Blizzard or a Blast or a Cherry Limeade. And I've got some music. I can get them to do just about anything. Now, music is powerful, but it needs to be their music. Their music from their past, not my music, especially if I'm dealing with somebody that's the next generation older than me. They don't want to hear my music. They're going to call it racket, just like I'm going to call my kids' music racket. Everybody has a music set, and it's usually the music between the ages of 10 and 25. So if you know what that music was, that's their music set. You can always use Christmas music. You can always use music like happy birthday. You are my sunshine. I've seen people who were nonverbal start to mouth the words to Christmas music before. Or to hymns. Religious music that was close to them when they were young. So we've got food, music, and here's animals and children. Animals and children. Whether we have real animals or we have dementia-friendly robotic animals or we have videos of animals, another great thing to do is go to YouTube and put, I love putting baby animals falling down. And my favorite, though, is to put children laughing, children laughing on YouTube with some ice cream. I can get just about anybody to watch little children laughing because have you seen this video of my grandbaby because my grandbaby is something else and even when somebody's trying to break a door down I was able to use that I'm going to help you break that damn door down I know it I hate that that thing's locked I wanted to show you something real quick and if I can just get them to come with me and look. Now, using the phone is not the best because it's a little bit too small. But an iPad usually works and the TV or computer screen usually works. So the four things that we go to for distraction, and this is going to be throughout the course of the disease, food, music, animals, and children. Here's our information here at the West Center. Um, we are a long-term care. We've been here for 30 years and we only do memory care. We also have a day program and we also provide education like what we are doing right now. I think Amy's going to, uh, Amy, Jamie is going to hop back on real quick and be able to tell us again about the CEUs. Yes, thank you, Holly. Um, we are offering one and a half CE credits for social work, nursing, licensed professional counselors, and if you want a certificate of attendance, uh, Marty will be sending out a follow-up email, and in that email will be a link to the Survey Monkey evaluation. If you want the CE credit, you must complete the Survey Monkey evaluation, and if you will allow us about three to four weeks to process those and send your certificate by email. Um, but we do ask that everybody completes the evaluation just so we can get your honest feedback and we can continue to provide um, great programming. Thank you. Great. In addition to the um, 
the Google survey, I'm, I'm sorry, in addition to the monkey survey, monkey, um, you will also, we also have a Google survey we're asking you to complete. Uh, the Google survey, sh there should be a pop-up after you, as you log out, giving you the option to go to the Google survey. Um, that is really um, helps us in reporting back our, on our goals and objectives that we set forth when we um, apply for the funding to put these on. Uh, just, I'll, I'll make a, a careful note that the survey monkey is required if you want CEUs or, or certificate of attendance. The Google survey is not required. We're just asking you to fill that out for us um, to give us your, your feedback. The other thing I, I, I've been adding recently, and I want to say is, I, I often, often get emails right after the webinars of, how do I get, what do I need to do to get my CEUs? Or where can I get whatever for, about CEUs? Or when am I going to get my CEUs? I get, I'll, I'll get, I'll, I'll get um, an email in two days saying, you haven't sent me my CEUs yet for this. You, you all, we go over this twice in each webinar. And if you're on here looking for CEUs, you're, you're required to be watching the entire webinar. So if you're on here and you don't know how to get a CEU once we're done, then you really haven't paid attention to watch this, the, the seminar. And, and I, I hate to do that, but it happens all the time and we go over it twice. Um, so please make a note that you really gotta, gotta listen about or, or, or refer back to the slides on how to get um, your CEUs. So I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> Turn it back over to you, Holly. <laughs> okay, and next month we will be doing part two, which is caring for someone in the middle stages of dementia. It will be on May 9th from two to 3.30. I'm gonna stop sharing and see if anybody has any questions or comments, or if anybody has, um, Jamie or Marty, if y'all saw any, or if you were able to answer anything. Yes, you will get a printout of the presentation and a copy of the presentation. Thank you so much. Jen is asking, in fact, in fact, the presentation, I just put that in the chat, that link just a couple of minutes ago. I put it in twice, but you'll also get that link in the follow-up email. Everyone that, that attended today will get that. Um, okay. Somebody asked, uh, Janet asked the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's, um, and, and, and she goes on to say, which is more severe? Okay, so the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's, if you think about that word dementia as the umbrella, think about the word cancer as an umbrella. If someone were to say, what kind of cancer does your loved one have? You give them a kind. So dementia is an umbrella. What kind of dementia? Alzheimer's is the most common type or kind of dementia. So Alzheimer's is the most common form, type, kind, or cause of dementia, but there's over 130 different types. So Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia. Now a person can have dementia and not have Alzheimer's because they might have vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's disease dementia. So that's the difference. Somebody else also said, what if the person keeps saying, I don't remember? <laughs> You can say to someone, and Jamie, hop in here also, You can, when somebody's saying, I don't remember, you may ask them, show me, if they can, again, try to go to the show me, tell me, um, and then try, I would really start trying to distract off, because that sounds like anxiety, uh, but, uh, out of I don't know what I'm supposed to do may be what they're looking for. Because many times if they're saying, I don't remember, I don't remember, but I don't remember and I don't remember. And I don't, what they're saying is I don't know what to do. I don't remember what to do. Jamie, can you think of anything else with that? No, the, the anxiety came to my head if they're mumbling. I mean, if you're in a situation and they say, I can't remember, tell me, show me. Um, but the anxiety, it might be just that anxiety that might, you know, there's medication that can help with that and a lot of reassurance, but then get them something, started on something that they can um, do. And I'll Tammy, see for somebody. Uh, oh, I'm me, sorry. Go ahead. Real quick. Uh, uh, Tammy, you have raised your hand. I see you've raised your hand. Um, we don't um, uh, call on people um, um, because we have so many people on. We've got 192 people on here. It's just too, too, um, too hard to manage that. So if you if you have something you'd like to say, a comment or a question, if you'll please put that in the chat or the Q&A. Thank you so much. 
I'm sorry. Um, and somebody else said, uh, I realize routine's important. Uh, what can be done when the person cannot focus to do physical activities or sit in a chair without an intervention? She wanders in the house all day until she's exhausted. That to me is another one that sounds a whole lot like anxiety. I don't know what to do, so I'm going to walk, I'm going to wander, I'm going to rummage. Now, what some people will do is they'll actually set up a rummage room in their home where anything and everything in that room they are free to go at it. And it may be uh, where they can rummage through drawers or old jewelry, or um, some people will use tools or sewing kits, something that they can do. But again, like we mentioned, and we're not about throwing medication at it, but if they're doing it till they're exhausted, I'd be concerned. Um, and they may, and keep in mind that all of these medications, we're going to use them for a little while. Because with dementia, these are going to be stages. So they may need an anti-anxiety for a little while until they turn the corner in the disease. They, just like the antidepressant, they're probably going to need for a little while. Whiteboard seems opposite to telling the person something like the doctor appointment shortly before it will happen. Whiteboard seems opposite. I think that there was a slide and somebody else asked about the whiteboard and that was an example and it depends on the person. Some people might do really well with visual aids to help them kind of orient themselves to time and day and they can keep going back to the whiteboard. Other people might not do so well with that or they don't use it anymore or look at it. So doing that, um, you know, it's time for our appointment right now or, or, you know, waiting till the time to the appointment. It just depends on the person. And some people with those whiteboards, I have actually seen people with the one like in that slide sit and study their whiteboard. Mm -hmm. I had a gentleman who he almost trained his wife because she would ask the same question over and over. And I told him, I said, just say in the same tone, look at your whiteboard, look at your whiteboard, look at your whiteboard. And he point at it and she'd sit there and she'd study. She'd go across and come down church. Mm -hmm. So she was asking, where are we going to church? When are we going to church? It's time to go to church. It's time to go to church. We've got to get stuff ready to church. Look at your whiteboard. And so he just had to, now he had to work on not saying, I said, look at your whiteboard. You know, <laughs> we had to work on that part of it. Um, somebody asked about the health journal again. It's actually just a small notebook. And I know you can't see it when I do the screen. It is a like a purse size notebook. It's just a little notebook um, that people can use as a health journal. You know, um, just so you know, we had a, a webinar yesterday and the Better Business Bureau uh, Foundation offers those for free of charge to, to any individual or they'll send, they'll send a, 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 a bulk to any of you that are professionals or, or in retirement communities and want to hand them out to your residents. I will include their phone number and a little note in that about the, in the follow-up email. Good. I want to so. also want to underline something that, um, that Holly said earlier. You know, whenever we, you're, you're dealing with people, especially when they're first diagnosed, you get so many people that ask, how can they help? They want to help. What can I do to help you? And, you know, I think a very important thing, and, and Holly touched on this, is to we have all of these webinars on our YouTube channel. I know that James L. West Center has lots of webinars on their, on their website. To, to, to go and, and pick one or two of them and say, get them to go look at those if they're going to be taking um, your, your, your loved one out to lunch or something, because it kind of prepares them to kind of know what to ex what they may expect. Um, and, and so it's, that, that information is out there for them to just take a look at. Somebody had also asked about how you find the best doctor. You always want to start with your primary care physician because there is memory loss that's not related to dementia and occasionally if all they're having is memory loss they're not having any other brain issues their thyroid might be out of whack they may be having a medication interaction they may be severely depressed they may be malnourished and we correct that I had someone whose electrolytes were off and they appeared presented as dementia. It was their electrolytes. Um, so you always start with a primary care physician. And then typically you end up with a neurologist or the geri gerontology is where you end up. But a lot of folks end up with neurology. I'll add one to that. Urinary tract infections. That is a huge issue that happens yep. all the time. And it's so easy to fix. 
It's just we don't we don't catch it. Yep. Yep. Uh, and then uh, someone else was asking if we're getting yes, the slides were put in the chat and then they will be sent out also. And one uh, lady asked, can being being a high strong or type A personality make a person more more susceptible to dementia? I don't know that it necessarily makes them more susceptible to dementia, but it may uh, exacerbate uh, after they have dementia. Just like I mentioned, the gentleman who was the insurance salesman continued to be an insurance salesman. Somebody who's a type A personality likely will continue to be a type A personality. Now, they may do the complete opposite and change later on, but it doesn't cause it that's not something that causes it we are right at time wow good session today lots of great questions well, i appreciate everybody being on remember next month we're going to do the moderate or middle stages of the disease and we'll we'll pick up from here next month jamie holly thank you so very much we sincerely you. appreciate you all we appreciate the partnership as you can see in, in, in the comments incredible information incredibly helpful Thank you all for joining us um, and um, look for the, the follow-up email. Um, it, uh, probably it will be tomorrow morning, but look for the follow-up email with the links and, uh, and the information we've talked about. Y'all have a wonderful day. Bye, everybody. Bye.